Eber, and what happens here affects you. So yeah. please, you're welcome. But in a way, but my question is about that. Um, so in terms of us getting City of Stirling to take it on, is there any kind of communication between the shires? Is it up to community members to make sure that the campaigns are aligned on the ground? Also because the Kulbinia residents are, well, the City of Stirling residents are probably much fewer than the City of Vincent ones. So it's just a question and I'm not sure if it was out of line. No, that's not out of line at all. It's a very good suggestion, Kim. And I know that the City of Stirling did put in a submission on the West Coast Highway proposal. Um, we can certainly touch base with uh, Stirling and ask them if they're making a submission. Might I be useful. For the, we could read the, yours and then put it into this. That's also an yeah. option if you wanted yeah. to do that. As a resident of the city of Stirling, you could also um, contact and um, make that suggestion as well. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Next speaker, please. So, should I, is there anyone else wishing to speak this evening? Okay. Thank you. Oh, we don't Walcott normally Street. allow coming back to the microphone twice. Sorry. But, uh, I also live on Walcott Street. So like yes. this lady, I wonder about Sterling because there are anybody I know living in the city of Sterling and the Kulbini area don't know anything about this. Okay. And All yet right. it's going to impact because it's literally at the stop at Walloona Street. Yep. All right. Well, look, we'll touch base with Sterling. We have conversations with our neighbours regularly on all sorts of matters. So that's not a problem. Thank you very much for your feedback, um, everyone. Some very well-considered points there. We really appreciate that. Um, just to explain for those who are hanging around. Oh, one more speaker. Please come forward, sir. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, I'm Philip Peroni, and um, we are the owners of the um, adjoining the proposed uh, project at 109. Originally, when we were first informed about the upcoming uh, project. So, Philip, you're talking about um, 109 Palmerston Street? Correct. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Although the letter that came from the council was dated the 10th and the 10th was on a Friday, nearly all of us never got that until about the end of the following week, which only gave us about four or five days to actually review it. We were also invited to come to the council and to discuss it and view the plans in house. Now, when I did arrive here, I really expected someone to show me the plans on a table rather than on one of those laptops that uh, you can't see it. And the only reason why I came here is so that I could visualize exactly what the project was because it's very, very hard to see or even read what, what it is that was being proposed. And also you know, on this occasion, and this is a, a suggestion that I respectfully ask the council to perhaps make the set of plans available when you are asked to have a look so that they are in paper and that we can put them on the table and exactly see what it looks like because it's a little, Thing like this is impossible to understand or read. The last notification that we got about tonight's meeting was also very, very short notification to every one of us. And when you consider there were something like about 120 items that both the councillors and the builders have had months, if not years, to formulate their answers and responses and the reasons for and against, well, it gave no one that I'm aware of any opportunity to be able to actually scrutinize or study what the responses were or the objections. So 120 items to try and ask people who are working day in and day out to try and understand or actually read them, is not really sufficient enough. And I think that the the owners and the residents deserve a little bit more courtesy than that so that we know exactly what's going on and we can either approve it or agree or disagree. So I respectfully ask that in future, not just with our project, but any other project, would you kindly give people enough notice so that we can actually study it and understand it better? Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And if you are um, wanting also to attend a site visit, I could arrange for the plans to be printed 
on paper, um, if that would help. If you would also like to attend a site visit during before next Tuesday, I can arrange to have the plans printed and bring bring paper versions to the site meeting. I believe that should be okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, was that our last speaker? Okay, that was our last speaker. So thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. And um, we haven't received any written um, questions or statements for this meeting. So just for, to explain for those who are remaining, this is this is not a decision-making meeting. This That will happen next Tuesday and you're welcome to come back. Um, this is an opportunity for council members to ask questions of administration, to seek further information, uh, to flag potential amendments. So this is sort of a working meeting now between council administration to help us process and deal with the decision-making meeting next Tuesday. So you're very welcome to stay and watch, um, but just explain what's about to happen next. And we do deal first with the items that have been raised by members of the community. So the first item that we will be asking questions on is item 5.6 of Charles Street Planning Study. And then we will ask questions in relation to 5.1, the um, development proposed development at 109 Palmerston Street. So without further ado, councillors, would you like to pose any questions in relation to the Charles Street planning study. Oh, my apologies, before we do that, it's extremely important that we do um, our declarations of interest. So CEO. I thank Sue Meko. I've just received one declaration of interest from Councillor Warner in relation to item 7.4, which is the first quarter budget review. Uh, it is a, a financial interest uh, noting that Councillor Warner is a director of Upbeat Events, which was contracted by the City of Vincent to manage the Oxford Street activation uh, for the Waffle Grand Final. And uh, that is referred to and noted under that item. And Councillor Warner is not seeking approval to participate in the debate, nor to remain in chambers, nor vote on the matter. Okay, thank you, CEO. Are there any other councillors that wish to make any declarations of interest on any items this evening? Okay, thank you. All right, then um, we'll continue where we were, which is um, dealing with item 5.6, Charles Street Planning Study. Councillors? Councillor Hallett? Um, I'll just pick up some of the comments from um, the public gallery about the inclusion of the public health plan as <coughs> um, bolstering the Charles Street um, argument. Um, just wondering if admin can comment on whether they can include um, some additional detail, um, in particular, the strategy 6.2, 10.1 and 11.1. Uh, through you, Michael, absolutely. I've noted those um, three points. They're great points to highlight in our public health plan. Um, so we will uh, add that as a section in our submission for next Tuesday. Councillors, Councillor Wallace. Sorry, can I just ask a follow up on this more about process? Um, the the completion of that section within the report, does that go to the manager for environment and wellbeing for review, for example, or is that, uh, I guess, who, who's preparing that port part? Because, I, you know, some of those comments were quite valid, I think. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, to date, I've been the manager that has reviewed the submission, but I'm happy to send that section to the manager of built um, environment and wellbeing for his review as well. Thank you. Councillors. Look, I'll just go through some of the um, issues that have been raised by residents this evening, some very good points um, from our community. Um, so just starting from um, the infrastructure WA strategy, referencing that, um, some of the issues raised around um, independent planning um, and self-funding, um, and also the $6 million Ford Estimates Transport Planning Study. So just picking up on those points um, from Andrew Main, he raised a very good point about the services, particularly the main drain. So it might be worth um, commenting on any services that the city is aware of. Um, and I think, I think the report does sort of touch on the social economic environment heritage, but I think there was a request to sort of perhaps formalise a request back through to main roads to actually um, prepare um, a response particular to those issues. Um, Councillor Hallett's picked up on the public health um, request. Um, 
there's also just about the, the you know, public health implications during the construction itself in terms of dust, noise, et cetera, pollution. Um, perhaps we, I know it's in here, but do we need to sort of broaden out the section on the mid-tier transit um, proposal? I know that it is mentioned, it might, might be sufficient, but that's sort of also just going to that issue of Metronet. Uh, and also the point raised about the um, Project Horizon, an additional PCA at this time, and what that would do in terms of decline along Charles Street. And also the request that we reach out to the city of Stirling. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I might just make a couple of comments on those points. Uh, the, inf the state infrastructure strategy did have a section about uh, essentially the state government's coordination mechanisms within the transport of, uh, portfolio between the Department of Transport, Main Roads and PTA, uh, essentially pointing out that Main Roads uh, gets to dominate uh, that discussion through um, the way it's funded and budgeted and planned for. And I think the point raised from the public gallery was essentially trying to point out that this proposal doesn't seem to adequately address or look at the option of equivalent investment in public transport or active transport infrastructure compared to a uh, car dominated um, plan, which then also relates to the costs about servicing for something like this. We're essentially being asked to comment on a planning study and a concept with some very heavy engineering interventions without even knowing what order of magnitude this might cost uh, the state government and uh, indirectly through um, the taxpayers uh, compared so we're essentially being asked to say yes or no or for or against what we assume is going to be a very expensive infrastructure project without being offered equivalent options, which might have a better cost benefit analysis through greater investment in public transport, which relates to the point that you made, Mayor Cole, on the section where we relate to mid-year, we talk about mid-tier transport, which again is in early stages of planning, but is something that the cities and councils transport strategy is strongly in favor of uh, in over and above uh, greater investment in and roads and facilitating the high volume and high speed movement of uh, passenger motor vehicles. Uh, again, you make a point, Mayor Cole, uh, from the public gallery, we have no idea how long the construction would be. Uh, this would be uh, by far the most significant engineering project in the city of Vincent in, in our history since the uh, Poly Pharma Freeway was constructed. Um, and it was raised a couple of times by the public gallery that uh, the uncertainty about if and when and whether it's funded and when it goes ahead uh, could create uh, certainly years, but potentially decades of uncertainty for investors, which means no positive movement happens until that uh, is understood, which could be a long, slow decline for businesses and for property owners uh, within and around that uh, around that area, because there's no guarantee that this would go ahead because we don't know how much it's going to cost, uh, and we don't know whether or not it would pass a, a cost benefit analysis as well. I think that were the main points you raised, Mayor Cole. We can we'll, we'll see how we can adjust the the submission to take into account all those points raised. Thank you. And then I had my own points that I wanted to um, <laughs> to add to that. Um, thank you for adding the schools onto the map. And I note that you've superimposed that over the map that um, Main Roads provided. So I thought it would be very useful to show the um, school catchment areas to show that that does cross Charles Street for both Kayala and North Perth Primary School. Um, it would be very useful to mark out the two signalised pedestrian crossings at near Selkirk and Elbert Street. Um, it might start getting messy, but perhaps this could, instead of being on the map, it might be part of that last section of the table to talk about walkable catchments to the public open space, um, which is also from a perspective, you know, for example, Ango Street walkable catchment might also be worthy of consideration. Um, I think that's covered off that the traffic data, that we're seeking the traffic data. Um, I also thought it'd be worthwhile talking about the upgrade of the intersection. So the intersection, I have seen a 15% design for 
Vincent and Charles, which which is looking at introducing left hand turns um, to prohibit that backlog of queuing. And I just wondered whether we needed to sort of maybe talk about the fact that we'd like to see progression of um, of improvements at the intersections prior to dealing with something of this significance and to say um, how far that would get and what the modeling would show if the um, if the intersections were upgraded to that much lesser impact. Um, I thought it was also worthwhile that we could potentially touch on the need for rights of way because we're talking about the fact that there'll have to be land takings to um, potentially secure uh, the additional width for um, Charles Street, but we haven't really talked about the fact that you wouldn't really have be able to then have properties entering from their homes onto Charles Street and that there would be potentially a requirement to create rights of way. And I was also just interested when we might be able to get the advice back from the DRP and whether we were going to be publicly releasing that as part of the final submission to main roads. Uh, to you, Mayor Cole, I can answer some of those. We'll absolutely um, consider those school catchment areas, the pedestrian crossings and the walkable catchments to POS in the area, um, and we'll make a judgment based on the map. It is very busy at the moment to see how um, busy it can get or if it should be in the text of the submission. Uh, in regards to those short-term interventions and any design that we have, uh, we will just have to consider the confidentiality of the information that we have at hand and what we can reference in this uh, submission. We have not included uh, anything on the rights of way as um, all relevant streets are still through roads to Charles Street and are in reasonable uh, proximity to those pedestrian crossings. Um, and we would not be looking to have that access off Charles Street in the future. So we haven't um, referenced that in the submission and that's the reason why. Mayor Cole, could I just pick up the point also raised about uh, talking to our local government neighbours about this uh, concept and City of Stirling will be on that. Uh, we will be getting together with City of Stirling and also the City of Melbourne shortly to discuss uh, our three councils' views on uh, what has been included in three separate planning studies around the duck and dive concept. There's a duck and dive concept being proposed by main roads for Canning Bridge in Melville, as well as West Coast Highway in the city of Stirling on Scarborough Beach. And uh, we have a shared concern about uh, that engineering solution. I just probably at this stage then need to declare an interest if the city is going to talk with other local governments about proposals that could come to the WA Planning Commission, then I will have a conflict. So I just want to put that on the table. To you, Mayor Cole, sorry, I just missed the point about the DRP feedback. We'll be uh, receiving that from our DRP member on the 24th of November. So that will become an attachment to our submission. Um, yeah. And so therefore we'll not be coming to council meeting next week. Okay. Just one final thing. Throughout the um, presentation, which the community has given some very great feedback on to you, so congratulations on that. Um, I just wondered, there is a, quite a few requests um, in there, and I thought that perhaps it might be good to actually pull out those requests and dot point them just to sort of be, you know, to sort of succinctly say these are the things that the city is, is seeking. Just a suggestion, not, you know, necessary, but I thought that might just help bring those requests forward. You can choose to take that feedback as you wish. Thanks, Mayor Cole. Council we'll Councillor Alexander. Uh, thanks, Mayor Cole. Um, I just wanted to understand the process from here on in if Main Roads doesn't agree with some of the uh, the issues that the City of Vincent and others have with what they're proposing. Does it then go to the WA Planning Commission, does it? Or what, what, is, the, what is the process to try and mitigate um, some of the things that Main Roads are proposing? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. So what currently exists uh, on Charles Street is something called a planning control area. Main roads, uh, as the asset owner of uh, Charles Street, uh, has had that in place for uh, quite a long time. And uh, main roads on a regular basis has to apply and reapply to the planning commission to have that planning control area extended. Because they've had that plan control extended for such a long period of time, 
they need to be able to prove to the Planning Commission that they are progressing with uh, a essentially a concept for what they'd like to uh, see done with that road reserve uh, in order to inform something called a uh, amendment to the Metropolitan Region Scheme. And an amendment to the Metropolitan Region Scheme uh, is something which would be considered by uh, the, the WAPC. So this information and this study that main roads are doing is essentially going to do two things, either inform a request to WAPC to extend that planning control area for another three years after the decades it's been in place, or actually to be able to put in enough uh, evidence to the Planning Commission to ask the Planning Commission to initiate uh, what would be a two-year process to amend the Metropolitan Region Scheme uh, in order to expand and widen that road reserve. Um, that commences with a request for an additional planning control area. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Castle? Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. Just, I just wanted to pick up one more point that was raised in the public gallery from Andrew Main around the Beattie Park heritage listing and the trees in Beattie Park Reserve. And I wonder if there's scope um, to consider the impacts as it's... Um, or the conflict with our sustainable environment strategy and the loss of tree canopy along that entire stretch with this plan. So um, just a suggestion that that might be something to be considered. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we have referenced the mature trees in these uh, submission, but we haven't noticed uh, the heritage elements of the park. So we will include those um, in our submission uh, and we'll note to see, have a review of that strategy and see if it can be referenced. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, just in, I feel like, um, Mayor Cole, you almost mentioned this around um, the DRP thing being public. I'm just wondering whether, given how contentious this is and it's not going to disappear quickly, um, and given that our minutes and things are somewhat difficult to access, whether there's scope for having um, the city's position put publicly on the website or um, with other attachments? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, absolutely. So um, if Council endorse our submission uh, next week, we can then publish that on the city's website and on the 24th, once we have the DRP uh, comments in relation to our submission, we can add that to there and have that publicly released. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so then the second item that was raised this evening is 5.1. 109 Palmerston Street, Perth, proposed for grouped dwellings. Any questions on this item, please? Councillor Hallett. Um, one was just a comment from the public gallery about being included in the dilapidation report. Is that possible? Through you, Mayor Cole. Sorry, could you just repeat, um, include what in the report? I think it was one of the neighbours who um, had been concerned about damage to property previously um, and whether that could be included. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we'll consider and include some comments in the briefing note and update the report. Um, there's a comment in there that the applicant had um, said that they would do solar panels and just wondering whether there's potential to include that as a condition, given that it's not actually in the application. Through you, Mayor Cole. I uh, will liaise further with the developer. That suggestion um, came about very late in the process when the report was being finalised. Um, there was no opportunity to update the plan, so we'll better understand the intentions of the, uh, the applicant and include more uh, information in the report and in the briefing notes. And just a question that kind of goes a bit more broadly, there was a comment about the renders um, coming out later in the consultation period. Um, and just thinking about the difficulty in sometimes interpreting development plans, and they can vary um, in their um, visualisation of um, what they've proposed. I think we've discussed this before about um, the process, including some kind of re renders or modelling, um, maybe for particular size dwellings. Um, just wondering if you can comment on anything we can do to in the development process for the city to ensure that... Um, those proposals are as visual as possible. Through you, Mayor Cole. So perhaps I'll, I'll um, just explain the journey this has been on. The plans that were submitted uh, included, um, I would say, minimal renders, but streetscape pers perspectives through the D 
DA process. Um, it's iterative. And uh, there was a request from the city's officers to relook at those renders and they were provided later on um, uh, through the course of the assessment process. And when we received those, I suppose that's when we took the opportunity, I guess, to update. So it's, it's difficult. Initially, we assess the, the quality of the plans that are submitted in terms of what is required to be submitted under the planning regulations, it meets those minimum standards, but we're always looking to obtain more information, particularly visuals um, that might assist um, not only community members, but also the city staff. Councillors, Councillor Castle. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, there were a couple of comments from, from various neighbours around the short time frame in general for this application. I just wonder if you could outline what um, the consultation process was and um, why this one might have been shorter than normal? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, perhaps I'll turn your attention to page 15 of the briefing agenda. So there's some commentary um, regarding the consultation process that we undertook. Ultimately, uh, the application was advertised as per um, prescribed policy standards and the same methods, uh, but we have noted uh, in our report that we were made aware by some of the residents, and you heard that tonight, that there was a delay in the postal delivery. So when we were notified of that, we extended out um, the consultation period uh, by an additional five days uh, to try to allow for that. In terms of uh, del uh, delivery delays, in the postal service, sometimes that can be problematic. And we have heard about this in the past, but when, when we are made aware that there may be a slight delay, we'll always try to extend, noting that the applicant is also entitled to a statutory process that they're, that they're going through and they're, they've got certain expectations. So it's about balancing that and making sure that it's a reasonable process for everybody. Councillors. Um, Manager, would you like the opportunity to just talk through um, the issue of the deemed to comply applied versus the um, design um, outcomes? I think that, you know, we've heard tonight about non-compliance and thought it might be useful just to sort of talk to some of those key issues that have been raised and how they've been assessed. So particularly in relation to the height, I think that's, that's one because that goes to overshadowing. And my reading of this is that the Skillian roof is over height, but at the lower, at the lower um, uh, section of roof. So just if you could maybe elaborate on how that um, additional height does or doesn't impact on overshadowing to something which would be deemed to comply. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, there's an explanation uh, on page 11. Of the I appreciate office. that, but I'm just asking because we've had questions in the gallery and I thought it might be good to discuss it. Yeah, yeah. sure. I'm happy to speak to it. I'm just drawing the attention for those that haven't had the opportunity to review our report. Um, it's on page 11 of the agenda, which sets out uh, two pathways for assessing and determining planning applications. One pathway is intended to be a streamlined, straightforward assessment, um, which is deemed to comply. It's prescriptive. Um, there's an alternate pathway, which is no lesser, which is uh, design principles, and ultimately that's more objective space. And there's a in the planning framework, there's uh, a list of what those design principles are, what those outcomes are that you that you need to demonstrate that you're satisfying. It's um, available to a applicant to seek uh, assessment against either of those pathways or a combination of both. This, uh, the officer report basically goes through all of the planning elements and it was identified by the resident um, this evening that you heard that there's a number of areas or planning elements where discretion is being sought. Um, and in respect to building height, that is one of the items. Uh, to go to your comment, Mayor Cole, yes, there is a deemed to comply standard for the bottom of a skillion roof, which is nine metres. That's what's um, set out in the policy framework. There's also a top of um, Skillian roof height in the policy framework, which is 10 metres. Now, um, what is proposed uh, is basically up to a maximum of 9.26 metres. So it wouldn't meet the bottom of Skillian roof height, which is one deemed to comply 
standard in the policy framework, but it would satisfy um, the top of uh, roof height. So discretion is still sought in respect to the bottom of the roof height. So that just needs to be weighted in terms of the impact of that 9.26 metre maximum wall height in terms of its impact. Overshadowing was referenced. So there is analysis um, of overshadowing included as attachment 11 in the report. So what the officers have tried to demonstrate in, in that is showing the subject site with uh, the adjoining property um, and also what the extent of overshadowing would be for the proposed development that's in the lighter blue, if you're referring to that attachment. And then there's a Can darker- you, Sorry, there's 133 pages. Can you just say which page number the overshadowing diagram is? Just trying to locate it. I think it's page- 136, three Yep. Oh, actually, I have 139, oh, 29. Sorry. The purple, the, the the violet, and then the sort of purple showing the difference. So that's the impact? Correct. The darker shade is um, uh, what would be from a deemed to comply uh, proposal in terms of building height and setback from that lot boundary, and the lighter shade is um, the result of the proposed development before you. So I'll draw your attention to where that lighter shade falls, um, which is primarily over that driveway area. So elected members uh, are required to consider what is the amenity impact of that additional overshadowing on that adjoining property. Thank you. Um, and just, we have had a request for a, slight, uh, a site visit. So if we can, um, you know, happy to help arrange and liaise and invite any council members who are available to come along to that. Um, we can go through some of these questions in more detail then, but does anyone else have any questions? Councillor Gonczewski? Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just a quick question on the visitor parking, which I understand has been assessed as, I guess, being approvable because the um, subdivision was approved under the previous version of the ARCOs and a, a visitor bay would not have been required. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Just, I guess, in terms of, um, so I'm clear on the process now in terms of subdivisions of this nature, if a subdivision of uh, this particular design was submitted to the city, the city would um, be providing advice to the WAPC that the, uh, I guess, um, that this subdivision did not allow the visitor parking provisions to be met. Is that um, the sort of advice that would be provided or is how are these things assessed now that the R codes have changed? Through you, Mayor Cole, if, if that subdivision application or if, if a subdivision application was submitted today, um, the city's response would need to be grounded in the current planning framework and the R codes that apply today require would require for a four group dwelling, one visitor bay, and that would be the response from the city's offices. Councillors, any further questions? Councillor Hallett. Just um, in terms of the overshadowing, there was a comment from the public gallery about um, afternoon shadowing across the road and just wondering if you can comment on whether that's, um, I guess, part of any considerations. Through you, Mayor Cole, overshadowing absolutely is a relevant planning consideration. Uh, in considering the extent of overshadowing, um, the R codes sets out the parameters and what those considerations should relate to. Uh, the R code says that you know, the, the worst case scenario, which is during winter solstice, uh, in the direction of a southerly direction, that should be the assessment. Uh, the pro development proposal would result in you know, exceeding 50%, which is the deemed to comply standard, can result in approximately 60%. The assessment, however, under the R codes is in the southerly direction. In terms of um, across the road, that would be more so in a southeastern direction. So though we haven't done the analysis and we can go away and do this and include it in the briefing notes if you would like, or if that's what's being requested, we can show what that um, the overshadowing would be during the course of the day as the sunlight traverses the sky, show what that impact would be to the nearby properties. If that's still, that would be good. Thanks. 
councillors, any questions? Okay, thanks very much, everyone. We'll organise that site visit during the week. Um, so they were the two items that were raised in the public gallery this evening. So we'll just work through the rest of the agenda sequentially. So that takes us to item 5.2, advertising of re reviewed local planning policy number 7.5.13 percent for art. Any questions on this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you. Um, this was a, a question or a comment that I had in relation to a number of the items on the agenda, just that I found that the um, some of the uh, text was blurry. Um, like the, I think particularly I noted in this one that I found it challenging to read the community consultation summary. It was late, and I wasn't wearing glasses, but I have just had a look, and I feel, feel that it, it looks, is thank because you. I have a printed version, and the printed version is also blurry. I feel that we're getting images rather than the original. Um, document and I think that's causing some problems because I think it's also the case with um, the financials when you blow them up they're, they're blurry so yeah, I think we we'll probably need finding, to so. try to resist using images and dropping them into documents. Um, and just to note that it's the same it's not a docs on tap issue because I was reading from the public agenda so it's the um, that so that was just that and then I had one small thing that I meant to email today and I'm very sorry I didn't I wondered, on page five of the policy, there's a bold subheading that says temporary or public art, and I'm wondering if that needs to be, was meant to be read as temporary or ephemeral public art. To you, Nicole, can I just... Do you love the word ephemeral? Uh, while, the, while, the, while the manager's looking for that reference, uh, I'll speak to Wendy just about how, when we PDF these documents, but... Uh, how that amalgamated where we're losing that resolution because I can see when it goes into the info council then it does shrink it slightly and we're losing it resolution on some of those attachments so uh, if need be we'll need to uh, circulate to council separate pdfs which have that high resolution. Um, That's just tricky though CEO if you're trying to have your agenda all in one space and then at a meeting you're going between email and docs on tap and Sometimes we're, you know, told to go to the website. Are we still considering moving across to Teams because we seem to have a few ongoing? I think issues. if I may just say, CEO, the issue was also on the pub. Like I have concerns for myself, but um, I have a, a larger concern that the public-facing document was also blurry. So whatever fix we do needs to be able to fi fix it for the um, public agenda on the city's website. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yes, very good pick up on page five. That should be um, ephemeral. Yes, we will amend that. Councillors, any questions? Um, I just wanted to inquire about the 15% discount and the professional artist definition just to see are those, is that sort of, is that they're both working? I love the inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait um, Islander artists. It does seem a very high bar and possibly that's an excellent thing because we do want quality public art. But I just wanted to sort of ask with, with both of those things, are we offering a discount that's encouraging the majority to, to pay out rather than actually produce public art? Are we getting a good balance? And in terms of the artist definition, are we still able to source artists from a good um, and sort of competitive, healthy pool of professional artists. To you, Mayor Cole, yes, absolutely. Both of these points were workshopped with our arts advisory group um, and they were confident that we would still be able to get very high quality art in regards to the definition. Um, and, yes, we perceive that the discount is appropriate in order to uh, make that option attractive and to allow people that don't feel like they want to take on that responsibility to allow the city to do that. Um, we're also just noting that those changes to the policy make it, uh, we're looking to make it quite clear on what that percentage contribution would go towards and make that contribution even more effective. Yep, so you're not getting the vast majority choosing to go down the 15% discount route. We're still, it's still enough of an incentive to support um, developers to produce their own artists and artwork as part of their build. 
To you, Michael, absolutely. We have a lot of applications that um, we just discuss with the Arts Advisory Group to assess whether they're appropriate and we have a, a good level that uh, developers are implementing themselves that are also of a high quality. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Warner? Hi, I just wanted to mention that at the uh, Arts Advisory Group meeting last week, we did discuss the uh, definition of a professional artist and I think there was a bit of feedback that would be great if that was incorporated into this um, just to, just to work on that definition a little bit, please. Has that feedback been incorporated? Not yet, oh, but I think it's okay. it's getting there. <laughs> okay, well, can we maybe have some advice in the briefing notes around that? Because if there has been further advice on the definition, it would be very good to know that before we adopt a policy with this current definition. Through you, Michael, yes, we will uh, have a look at that definition to reflect those comments last week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Warner. Any other questions? And I mean, it's not a meeting for talking, but you know, 1998, it's a, you know, pretty impressive. Um, okay, no more questions, then we'll move on to item 5.3, cash in lieu of public open space. Any questions? Um, I did have a brief question about whether advertising was considered. I know it talks about the fact that there will be a sort of a form of informing, um, but this is a quite a long lead up time to the 1st of July 2023. If if people do want to provide comment, given that we're resolving to in, the recommendation, sorry, is to resolve to implement, um, how is comment received? <laughs> Uh, to you, Michael, absolutely. The consultation that we are proposing is an inform um, to inform people of the process that we are, are proposing to undertake as per the report. If we do receive comments regarding that process and we're able to make changes that are in line with uh, the uh, public, with the, yes, public open space strategy is what I'm trying to say, um, and the development control policy um, 2.3, then we will make those, but just being clear that we are providing that lead time because it is an inform that this is something that we are proposing to start if we receive council's endorsement on that um, and that we will take on feedback on uh, the way in which we commence this process, uh, but we will not be uh, kind of doing consultation on whether we should or we shouldn't as it does align with those policies um, at the state level as well as our um, local strategy. Thank you. Um, and also just interested to know when we might next be reviewing our public open space strategy. Uh, to you, Mayor Cole, we do an annual uh, update of that, um, which will be coming back to council in February of next year. And we would be doing a major review of that uh, in 2024. Thank you. Very across your brief there, manager. Any further questions? Okay, moving on to item 5.4, wayfinding signage plan. Are there any questions? Councillor Gonchewski. Another one from, another couple from the email I um, uh, was going to send some apologies. Um, I note that there's a black background that's sort of appeared in this document that I'm not sure is in, I've sort of seen as part of the styling of other um, City of Vincent strategies and plans. And I also note that the City of Vincent, like the non-town centre, non-active transport, non-park colour is charcoal. And I guess I just wondered whether those two things were related. Like, are we bringing charcoal into the City of Vincent design brief um, as a result of this sign? Or uh, what is there? Is there an interplay? Is I guess my question, because um, I did notice it as being quite strong. And from a pedant's point of view, I don't think that having things on that might need to be printed are recommended to have on black anymore because of the uh, excessive ink. But that's very pedantic. The other thing I had a question around was um, on the sign page that demonstrates the different signage opportunities, and this was the blurry part, 
it looked to me as though there was a signage opportunity that potentially was saying it was on a lamppost that felt to me as though it might actually be on a piece of William Street public art. No, not that one. You Next mean the lanterns. Mm. And I guess I just wanted to ask the question around the um, the town centre signage not being particularly visually bright. So that the, the town, the stuff that's outside town centre is not being particularly bright. It's in the charcoal, and whether that was, um, I guess, uh, uh, um, intentional or. Um, and, and what I guess what the rationale behind having that sort of charcoal colour is noting that other local governments often have, you know, a bright colour for that sort of directional signage. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, regarding the um, black and the colour of the strategy itself, I do note the comments regarding uh, the printing. This strategy is planned to be electronic only um, and not printed. Uh, it is not, it's something that will guide our decision making around wayfinding um, and signage, but it is not something that we plan to kind of promote and print out in um, the community. So we're uh, not concerned about that, uh, but it is a really good point. Um, regarding the charcoal on the town centre colours itself, uh, that is a Vincent White colour, as you've referenced, and it's to be used in unique circumstances where there is no other typology is appropriate. Having said that, we've got the colours for the town centres to mark that you're in a, in a dis destination. So we don't want to be confusing that when you are uh, travelling within the between those destinations that there is another colour. It is the black just to ensure that you understand that uh, you are part of that kind of wayfinding system through consistent typology and form, but that you are not at a new destination, but that will be marked by the colour when you uh, hit that town centre. Uh, the black also was chosen as it was informed by the elders and represents the black cockatoos and will be able to... Um, work quite well with any of the information that goes on it due to the fact that it is quite uh, simple and plain. So we took on that uh, feedback from the elders based on that colour for that one specifically. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess the my, uh, when we workshop this, I asked a question about, say, someone who might be in the Leaderville, in Leaderville need, wanting to make their way to Beatty Park and how that might interact with the current colour scheme. Could I just get, with what's been presented to us as the approach, could I just get an understanding of the colour schemes and how they would interplay for someone undertaking that theoretical journey? Yeah, Michael, absolutely. You'll see on um, the final pages of the executive summary on 16 and 17, it's pulled out. Uh, that So we have asked the consultant based on that feedback to uh, have a look at, um, you know, our town centres and those usual mapping routes that people would take within our town centres using that example. Uh, we have looked at what the current um, the current user experience, uh, visitors wayfinding experience, we've called it, uh, is. And then we've looked at what we look at as the future visitors wayfinding experience within the Leadable Town Centre. Uh, we've marked those key areas to ensure that people uh, can see how people would travel from one of those uh, locations to another. And we've included that Beatty Park location, as we have seen that, of course, they may travel from Leadable through to Beatty Park, and we've noted that they may then travel down to the Pickle District. Um, so we have mapped that out for uh, you to see uh, in those pages 16 and 17 of that executive summary. Thank you. I may not have got to it because it was blurry. I don't think the actual document is blurry, but yes. Um, okay, any other questions, Councillor Arflo? Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's just a question about the uh, recommendation itself. The, the, just the term adopts. I don't know if there's a difference between adopts and, and endorsed and whether we're actually, when we come to vote on this next week, whether we're actually um, approving the implementation. So I, I'm just not, I just want clarification about adopts versus endorsed versus the actual implementation. If you may call it, might be a governance question for how. Uh former manager or acting manager, uh, we 
on throughout throughout the agenda you'll see approve authorize endorse um it's a bit gray which one we go with uh, maybe the executive director could uh, my understanding usually you endorse a position and you adopt some form of action so i'd expect it to be probably adopt rather than endorse <laughs> And through you, Mayor Cole, sorry, just to add on to that, you are approving the strategy, the, uh, I suppose, the typologies, that design, um, and the uh, format of those signs. But no, you're not approving a set of implementation that we, or a budget that we will go forth, forth and implement. That would be happening through that budgetary process. Just noting that on this financial year's budget, we do have budget set aside for implementation for this financial year. But if we were to look at any further implementation, that would have to be approved through that budgeting process. Okay. So just to, and go on. No, I support that perspective from the manager. Okay, so it's high level. Uh, I don't know if it's approval of the the creative, the idea, the creative, but this will then the next logical step should this go forward and be uh, adopted would be a, uh, a a financial budget, even though we've got some budget, with it, which is effectively approving the implementation. Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, it's a, it, it's approving the the form, the style. Um, the look of the signage that we would uh, implement, it's because we have money on budget, we would, if this was a, um, adopted, we would go forth and implement with that money that we do have on budget this financial year. But yes, any future implementation would be required to be adopted through the city's annual budgeting process. Thank you. That's, that, that provides a, a good level of clarity for me. Um, final question because the and the reason I'm asking is a lot of detail in here like direction of arrows and so very specific information my question is is administration looking for feedback on that at this point given that we aren't approving it for implementation like on the very level of like the, the detail is that what you're looking for or just a if a, you know high level that we that we're in agreement with the general concepts bang and you might change the detail later as part of the implementation for you, Mayor Cole, we would not be proposing to come back to council every time we implement on the design. We would be looking to come back to council um, for approval for the budget and we would implement that wayfinding based on this wayfinding plan. So if there's any feedback or commentary on the design, uh, we're looking for that now. Like anything we, even if it's small, you'd want us to raise it now in terms of questions um for your consideration otherwise this is the plan should it be implemented through you Mayor Cole. yes this is the plan should it be implemented and the implementation would be based on the detail in this plan so if you do have any questions council it would be great to get them in before next tuesday um any other questions on the wayfinding signage plan okay the next item is 5.5, .5, Banks Reserve Master Plan, next stage of implementation. Any questions? Um, manager, I have some. I'm happy for you to take these on notice or answer. Um, I just wanted to ask about the existing toilet. Will it be reused, the modular? Um, I'd be interested to know whether we, I know that the um, plan for the bridge will make a really nice connection from the playground to the toilet, but in the meantime, has there been consideration of having some signage in the, in the play active zone to alert people to the fact where the toilet is, particularly with young kids, there's not a lot of time to play with. Um, I was also interested to know the number of toilets and um, I'm assuming this is $350,000 in total, the DBCA contribution and $200,000 for the toilets. Is that, I'm not sure if, quite sure if it's $200,000 for the toilets or $150,000 because one stage I added it up to three hundred, dollars and then I saw later it looked more like three hundred and fifty. dollars uh, to you, Michael, I can answer some of those. I'll have to take the um, questions about the reusing of the toilet and the number on notice. Uh, the signage in the active zone, we can actually look through uh, to implementing that with the um, budget that we have on wayfinding if the wayfinding plan is approved next week. 
And to confirm the money for the toilets, that is $200,000 $200, for the toilets um, with the remainder going towards the interpretation note. Thank you very much. Questions, councillors? Okay, moving along then to item, we've dealt with item 5.6. So we move to infrastructure and environment items 6.1, RFT IE225 of 2022, electrical switchboards and electrical rewiring replacement works for Beattie Park Leisure Centre. Any questions? Okay, item 6.2, EOI for e-scooter shared scheme in the City of Vincent. Any questions? Councillor Castle and then Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a question around the um, going it alone on these EOIs because the original discussion was around a shared contract across the local governments and that that would allow people to move from Vincent to Perth easily in the same um, provider and now Perth is going it alone, we're going it alone. What's the impact of that in how usable these systems might be? Uh, thank you through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, good question. Uh, that was the original uh, concept put to council earlier this year that there would be a single EOI for the five members of the inner city group uh, plus potentially uh, the Kings Park board uh, and UWA. Uh, the City of Perth had volunteered to coordinate and undertake that procurement process on behalf of all the other uh, members. And essentially through that procurement process and taking some legal advice, uh, City of Perth decided uh, that it would be uh, better for them to undertake the procurement initially, uh, the EOI just for the City of Perth area, uh, as opposed to uh, potentially complicating a joint procurement exercise, which raised a question, uh, wasn't a question which the city of Vincent or myself thought um, was a high risk. It raised a question on whether or not that might have required uh, additional approval around um, joint procurement, uh, which could, could potentially raise um, competition issues in the market. Uh, that wasn't a concern uh, that I had or uh, the city of Vincent uh, shared. So uh, we're essentially gonna undertake um, separate but parallel EOIs. I think we'll get to the same outcome, a little bit less coordinated on paper, uh, but we're are asking or seeking council to approve us opening up that EOI. The way that would work in practice is that City of Perth's tender or the EOI is already open, already seeking submissions. I uh, propose that the City of Vincent opens up our EOI. We would not close our EOI until the City of Perth had uh, confirmed the outcome of theirs. Um, and the criteria that we're seeking council to approve essentially makes operational compatibility with our neighbours, for instance, City of Stirling, who already have a trial underway, City of Perth, obviously, and other uh, councils, if they pursue it, uh, that we would assess uh, any submissions we receive for compatibility with uh, existing operators on the assumption that uh, there would not be much point for our residents to for us to approve a scooter uh, company that didn't have approval to operate in the city of Perth, uh, particularly because we think there'd be a great benefit for commuting into the CBD. Long answer, a bit complicated. Uh, I think we'll get the same outcome, but it'll be separate EOI processes. Thank you. That makes sense. And um, I note that in the details, there's scope for more than one company to be accepted. So there are a couple of um, prominent players in the, in the market. I, I suppose a likely outcome is that those will be considered and they'll be the same ones that are considered in Stirling and, and Perth. Um, I have uh, just another question around some of the detail of where and how they can be used in Vincent. Will that be part of the tender process or will that come later in the um, contracting process? And I'm thinking about geofencing of areas like Hyde Park, whether we'll have any slow zones um, in particular areas. At what stage in the process do you determine that? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we would suggest that we go out quite broadly to uh, attract um, hopefully some positive responses. Uh, and then we would come back to council uh, and the agreement that we strike with any company would allow us to change that or to mark areas as exclusion areas, slow areas, uh, for instance, and where we'd want um, those things to be docked. Uh, we would 
that would be part of a for a further approval by council uh, once we'd already started um, discussions with a provider and then the terms and conditions and how that would work and we would be learning from other councils as they go through this as well. Go ahead, Councillor Hallock. Thank you. Um, just in relation to the criteria for assessment, um, they're all basically about operations and there's no specifications that we traditionally would use for procurement. Um, and I'm just wondering about things like design quality, no third party advertising on the scooters and environmental impact and reconciliation actions of the company itself and whether some of that can be included. Uh, through Mayor Cole, uh, our officer has just written all those things down. Uh, so we will certainly um, uh, incorporate that. And if we need to make amendments between now and the OCM, we'll do that. Uh, this does relate, the question relates to the issue we had with the city of Perth. Uh, to, be to be clear, we're not procuring the service uh, for the city of Vincent. So we're not seeking goods or services for the city of Vincent, a procurement exercise. It's uh, what we're essentially offering or suggesting is EOIs for us to give an approval to operate uh, within the city of Vincent. Similar for, for instance, how a food van operates. A food van wants to operate in the city of Vincent. You can operate in these areas and these are the, these are the conditions that we would oppose. So uh, it's not a procurement exercise from uh, procuring goods or services, uh, but we use the same process, the criteria, and we'll come back to council uh, who has the final decision on those issues. Still important considerations, particularly like the said party advertising. They are extremely bright, these scooters. Go ahead. As a question, um, I guess, would you share concerns that we may end up, um, you know, the City of Perth came up with a, um, a company that we weren't particularly happy with that we'd be forced into doing that just because of that consideration versus others? Uh, through Mercol, that that would be entirely up to um, council to approve or not approve uh, an operator, including whether or not um, how long the how long the operating period was for, and whether that should be renewed, whether it was a twelve month approval or two years, uh, for instance. So uh, we would be able to mitigate those risks, and that would the appropriate time would be when we come back to council with a recommendation whether to approve or not approve one or more more operators. Councillors, Councillor Gonshevsky. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my questions were similar to Councillor Hallett's. I think the one that I had was safety um, in terms of the um, whether uh, respondents will be asked to demonstrate their, um, I guess, safety and reliability of their scooters um, and any safety mechanisms that their product that they would be seeking approval to operate within the city would have in terms of, and, you know, I guess, confirming compliance with um, current um, speed limiting provisions and then also, I guess, some commentary in relation to um, helmet use. Uh, through me, Cole, all, all good points. Uh, absolutely, the safety and reliability of the operator would be important and uh, nearly all the current operators in Australia are essentially linked to multinational corporations. Um, with We can set the speed zone speed limits on uh, most of these machines. Uh, a lot of the um, accidents we've seen in the stories uh, in Perth and elsewhere are re related to private e-scooters where the private owners have essentially modified to make these things go a lot faster than they um, should otherwise uh, go. Uh, I'll check with our officer about um, the, the using a private or a shared scheme, the same rules which the state government has announced through the Department of Transport and Office of Road Safety, that would apply equally for private or public users. Uh, I think helmets are required. Do you just want to come to the microphone? I'll just introduce our active transport officer, Tim, who's confirming helmets are required and some of the operators do provide helmets uh, for the shared scheme? Uh, all of the operators currently in Australia do provide a helmet with each um, scooter. And there's different mechanisms for confirming that the rider is using the helmet. Some of the uh, companies require uh, a photograph to be taken. Um, that 
may or may not be the best option, but um, there is it's it's built into the system that helmets are used, and also the um, devices. Uh, what we'd be seeking is um, uh, regular maintenance of the scooters and the accessories to ensure safety. Thank you. Um, I guess what I um, appreciate that additional detail. I guess my question to uh, the CEO of the, the city related to the proposed criteria of assessment for proposals. I do note from the um, recommendation, um, it does say that that we would be seek that the criteria referenced in the report, which is, is what the city would be going out with in their EOI, um, and just wondering whether so the points that Councillor Hallett and myself have raised could then be added to that. So we gather that information from each of the providers. Uh, through you, Mirko. Yes, we'll revise and update the criteria for the OCM uh, for next Tuesday. Councillor Hallett. <laughs> Sorry, a couple of um, things prompted. But just in terms of the um, my comment about environmental impact of the company, um, this is a question. Um, my concern about the multinationals flooding the market with um, cheap, um, poor quality e-scooters um, that actually result in worse outcomes for the environment. Um, and just wondering whether there could be some kind of thought around um, that quality and life cycle assessment of the, the products that they're providing. Uh, through me, Cole, my thought is I'm hoping uh, every trip by uh, one of our residents on an e-scooter replaces a potentially a trip in a uh, fossil fueled uh, automotive vehicle. Uh, it's we'll... a car. It's okay. <laughs> it's not a dirty word. <laughs> and uh, we will check on uh, whether the manufacturing and the uh, sustainability of the product because uh, well, there's tens of thousands of these things around the world now. So um, I'm pretty sure we could find that information and provide that to council. Oh, I'd just like to welcome Councillor Loden to the meeting. I'm not quite sure how long you've been there, Councillor Loden, but I've just spotted you. <laughs> welcome. My head's clearly not big enough on that screen. <laughs> well, I think for a while, though, I could only just see us on the screen, so I'm not quite sure if you were just hidden, so sorry to miss you there. Um, councillors, any other questions? Councillor Wallace, our resident e-scooter rider. Yeah, thank you. Um, Huge fan of scooters, yes, uh, but I'm pretty concerned about public nuisance that they can potentially cause. I was just wondering if we're kind of seeking to impose any performance criteria around uh, levels of public nuisance by abandoned scooters, whether that's appropriate for inclusion here or that's something that would come later with the licence. Uh, through you, Mirko, uh, yes, um, we would assess, uh, we'll, I'm confident we'll get more than one uh, proposal and I'm confident we'll be uh, therefore, they'll be competing for that level of service for how many staff they'll have around uh, with minivans to pick up um, dumped scooters, which have been dumped or put in the wrong place. Uh, I might just ask the, uh, Tim to comment on some of the levels of service that we've seen in other trials around Australia. Uh, the City of Perth uh, EOI that's currently out um, does have some key performance indicators around the level of service in response to poorly parked scooters and things that need repair. Uh, we could, um, or our intention would be to follow a similar vein with our EOI and have those um, performance levels built into the, the contract. And that would kind of form the basis for our assessment of how successful the trial was at the end of the proposed period if we did proceed. Yeah, that, that's definitely correct. Um, also, what we would be doing is um, having a system that is adjustable through the course of the trial. So what we start with, um, we may amend if we're finding that the level of public, public amenity is suffering in a particular town centre or area. Uh, what we would be looking for is um, the ability to adjust the system uh, to ensure that we maintain standards. Great, thank you. Councillors, um, I just had a couple of quick questions. Um, we're talking about a trial, but then the report doesn't talk about a trial. The council's being asked to approve um, an e-scooter share system to operate within the city of Vincent. So I just wanted to check, is this a trial? 
And with the 12 months, with the 12 month option, I'm assuming that's at the city's option, but I just wanted to clarify that. Um, are we still calling this a trial and also how, so I know that there will be community interest. So if it is a trial, how will we be receiving community feedback through through the through the um, trialing of e-scooters? Uh, through Mayor Cole, uh, we think 12 months uh, provides a sufficient time throughout the seasons uh, to see how they are used and then also uh, to give a long enough period for uh, hopefully some behaviour change for people to adjust the way they move around and get to work to use an e-scooter rather than a car um, or other, other form of vehicle. Uh, the 12-month extension would be um, at our discretion based on any approved provider uh, essentially performing uh, against the KPIs that we're comfortable with. So um, we haven't specified what that feedback and consultation would be. Uh, we certainly would expect that there some to be some complaints about some nuisance early on, but we want to see if that can normalise and whether or not e-scooters or uh, they call micro-mobility uh, can integrate over time into our transport network and we can learn to share footpaths, not the roads, but learn to share those spaces in a way uh, that doesn't cause conflict between pedestrians, uh, e-scooters, cyclists, uh, and and others. Okay, well, I guess I'm just asking the administration, is this a trial? And if it is a trial for the first 12 months before council then considers the extension for another 12, should this be something that we have on our engagement page where people can go on, find out about it, timeframes, what, you know, what we're doing, and then have a place where they can provide feedback throughout that period? Question. Uh, through you, Michael. It's a good question. I, I think before we get to the end of the 12 month period, we'd want to be able to uh, have a mechanism for some feedback uh, from residents, both users and uh, non-users. Uh, so if we could undertake to council that we would do that feedback and uh, public consultation in advance of a council report at the um, before the end of that 12 month period. Well, could that some something to that effect be included in the report, please? And just one final question. Um, I know that the objective is to have the capacity for the scooters to travel amongst the inner city area, but do we need to stipulate that we don't want the scooters that we may uh, have an EOI with to be restricted to the city of Vincent so that you might then have to hop on a city of Perth scooter to continue your journey? Like, we do we need to sort of talk about um that you know it talks about compatibility but maybe also the ability to cross borders because i know sterling for example has got very strict parameters about where the scooters can go and they're wholly within sterling within a um, geofenced area so i'm just the question is around do we need to stipulate that they need to be able to cross borders uh thumeco will make that clearer in the amended uh, report and criteria thank you councillors any other questions Okay. No, sorry, Craig, this is not a public question. Time is closed. Yep, thank you. Um, moving to uh, community and business Mayor services. Cole. Can I go back? Can we yes. go back? Can I ask a couple of questions on yeah, the tender? Oh, sorry, you haven't finished on e-scooters? Uh, no, um, I wanted to go back to the tender for the electrical switchboards, which I oh, didn't raise the question sure. at the time. Yes, you can ask questions on the switchboards. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, it was just around the procurement policy, like um, in the legal section, it says that we prepared this tender in accordance with the purchasing policy and rather relevant other things, but that policy requires, I think, three written quotes for items over 250K. Just wondering if the third would be forthcoming or I guess why we, if I'm correct that we're outside the purchasing policy there and why that's acceptable. Um, whilst I did seek clarification and include it in the briefing notes, my understanding is that we didn't just go out for a quote, we went out for tender, and uh, there is no requirement for a minimum uh, number of recipients in respect to a, a request for tender. If we got one, we'd assess the one. If we get two, we'd assess the two. That's my understanding of the policy, but I will clarify that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question on that one? I see Dan's taking the opportunity now, Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thanks, Councillor Wallace, for reopening that one. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, given we only had the two, 
is there merit in going back out again? Is there a reason for it? We've got the two options on the table, but there might be others. I know that we didn't get everybody coming back to us that we wanted to, but could we go around again? And what would be the consequences if we deferred this item and requested quotes again? Uh, through the chair, I'll include some information in the briefing note just to clarify what uh, we believe that the market currently has in respect to uh, addressing the specific needs of uh, that particular piece of infrastructure. Uh, and uh, as I said, I'll include that in the uh, briefing note and what the consequences might be and the delays might be in respect to going back out to the market. Thank you. And then my second one was just the cost increase. Is that this uh, COVID premium that we're seeing coming through here compared to what we budgeted? Jim right. Echo, I might just respond to the, the first question and we'll check this in the briefing notes. Uh, I think this is the second time round that we've gone through this process because we did try to procure and do a tender earlier, uh, which we weren't comfortable uh, with in terms of the respondents. So uh, what that led us to do was a lot more detailed work with a consultant on how to prepare that uh, tender to be more specific about what we're looking for. So this is actually the second, I think it's actually the second time we've gone to market seeking uh, a supplier to undertake these works. Uh, could you repeat the second question, please, Councillor Loden? Trying to remember what it was now. Oh, the, the cost increase. Um, so is this, uh, we, we would have budgeted a certain amount for what we saw this was going to cost and it's gone, it's above that budget to my interpretation of reading the, the briefing notes. Um, is that, do we know what the cause of that is? Is it just a, an overrun on what we thought it was going to be or was there more scope included than what we originally planned? Or? Uh through the chair, I suspect it's a combination of uh, both increased scope because we got a better understanding of what we were dealing with uh, and also a, a reflection of the market at the moment. Uh, but we'll clarify that in the briefing note. We're we happy to move on, everyone. Okay, great. Um, so community and business service items, item 7.1, financial statements as at the 30th of December, sorry, September 2022. Councillor Hallett. Um, I just wanted to ask about the delays in the light fleet vehicle procurement um, and the reason for that and whether there's scope for us to revisit um, either how many or what type of vehicle, depending on how long those delays are. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I'll include some notes in the briefing notes. I'm not 100% across uh, why we've got some delays. I understand that there is uh, uh, some difficulties in actually obtaining e electric vehicles at the moment, but I'll get some clarification around that. Councillors, any further questions on financial states statements? Okay, 7.2, authorisation of expenditure for 1st of September to the 30th of September. Any questions? 7.3, investment report as at 30th of September. Any questions? 7.4, first quarter budget review 22 to 23. Questions? Councillor Iopolo. Um, Councillor um, Warner is just leaving the chamber with a financial interest. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can I just clarify from administration that recommendation E would be better worded uh, to say subject to F because F has to happen and be the variation needs to be approved um, before you actually do that reallocation. <clears throat> uh, Theo Mercol, uh, we'll double check the language on that and make a, a change if required. Uh, the, the variation uh, needs to be submitted to the federal government, which runs that program. So we're essentially asking if council is comfortable with E to reallocate uh, against those four projects 
um, if council approves E, then I would then uh, submit that paperwork to the relevant department in Canberra. Yeah, and just to clarify the question, not, my understanding from the the um, agenda item was that the reason why administration is asking for E is because it believes the delays in the change room for Biddy Park change room um, modifications or works won't be is being delayed because of uh, supplier issues. And therefore, you're worried about, my question is, you're worried about that funding being lost because of uh, you'll only have two months to finish construction in the financial year. And therefore, you have to do this variation because you don't want to lose the funding. And therefore, E is, to me, connected to F. So that's the nature of the question. Um, <clears throat> my second question um, relates to the um, just the local roads and community infrastructure program. So this grant funding that we are we had applied for in terms of BD Park change rooms. The question is, um, is the grant subject to the work actually being completed or started? Uh, through the chair, my understanding is that the works need to be completed uh, for the funding to be uh, received. Okay, and and given the delays, what was the actual the for the BD Park change rooms? How long was the actual plan of works once it, like how long do you think it actually is going to take? So clearly more than two months. Uh, through the chair, I understand it would have taken longer than two months, but there was some uh, doubt over the ability to complete within that window. Uh, so to remove any uncertainty, it was thought prudent to reallocate those funds to ensure uh, they were received on projects that we are quite comfortable and that we will achieve within that uh, uh, end of financial year timeframe. Yep. And and final question on that at this point. Um, even though it's clear that the the E and F are connected, I'm not sure if the my question to administration is I'm not sure if the numbers presented in A through D would be affected if the um, the variation under F wasn't approved. So if if they are if those numbers are going to be affected by that, I think. Maybe we can get clarifications to whether they would move or that those numbers would change or not. Thanks. Uh, through uh, through Mayor Cole, uh, no, there wouldn't be any change any other budget numbers in the, those recommendations. Um, essentially, we reallocated muni funded projects to allocate that funding across and then a bit of a swap. So um, the only way those other budget recommendations would change is if we were to lose the funding, and that would then change the um, the net surplus. Councillors, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you. So my questions are kind of the same as Councillor Apollo's. I guess um, is that uh, we've sort of in some ways tried to differentiate previously about projects that we would do subject to getting grant funding, and if we didn't get the grant funding, we wouldn't proceed, and some pro uh, projects that we're already committed to and are already going to do and we'll kind of do whether or not we get the grant funding. And I guess I just wondered in relation to the projects that have been proposed here are, um, are, I guess, already in train, a number of them. And so should F not go ahead, we would then have to come back here and redo all of this again, wouldn't these numbers again, because we're going to have to have to then um if we've, we're committing to doing the projects, this is just an on paper the way they're funded. So I wondered whether we should actually be having the, I guess effectively um, having that we're authorising the CEO to submit a variation or an application for I through uh, one through four, and then that we would approve the reallocation of funding subject to that approval being received. And then all of all of these underneath, but um, I'll leave that with you. But I guess it's just in terms of actually thinking about what needs to come first. Um, not don't have any questions in relation to the particular projects that are proposed. Um, just wanting to make sure we're following the project, the process. Um, my other questions that I just had was, and I'm sorry if I've missed it. Um, could I just get some information in, in relation to the Leaderville uh, football? Leaderville football oval roof instead of the Woodville roof. We're swapping that over and what's happening to Woodville. Um, 
the administration building meeting spaces project um are we is this increasing the amount of funding or is this a new project um that's being uh, proposed to be included on the basis of this budget review um the north perth bowling club um and my apologies, I, I didn't get to track this against the existing approved capital works program. Um, as to the works in that, are we um, uh, are these being brought forward? And I guess what capacity do we have to deliver that this year? Um, and also throughout the document, it talk, in relation to the Norfolk Street North South bike route, it talks about. Um, that this is a decrease in the transfer from the asset sustainability reserve due to reduced capex spending and the DOT grant being capped at 25k bracket 50% of the project, and I wondered if that should be 250k. Um, but just if I could um, have some info on those in the briefing notes, that would be fantastic. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, so, firstly, with the roof. Um, I think it was determined that the Lydiaville oil roof was more critical than the Woodville Reserve. So um, that's been prioritised. That's what that uh, swap is for. Um, the meeting space is a new item in the budget. So um, we are finding it increasingly difficult to find meeting rooms in the city um, with collaborative working and a lot of um, remote working. So that's a, a new item. Uh, the North Perth Bowling Club, I might to include that one in the briefing notes. Um, but Norfolk Street, um, those are essentially the adjustments of the current budget position. So uh, we're pulling less funds out of reserve. So the 125 represents half of the 250 reduction, essentially. So I think that it, instead of saying 25K throughout the document, it should just say 250K okay. in the explanation. Okay. The number in the actual money column is fine. Okay. Three Mackell will include that in the um, updated version. Um, on the North Perth um, Bowling Club, the idea here is that we're trying to get a third, a third, a third for what um, was estimated originally as an $80,000 election commitment from John Kerry, MLA, the Honourable John Kerry, MLA. Um, but then when the city went in to look, this happened without the city having um, been requested to review and provide a, a, an estimate uh, because of the nature of the upgrades needed in terms of accessible toilets, et cetera. Um, it's more, it's estimated to be more of a $300,000 commitment. Um, so there's, the, the idea behind this is that it's a third, a third, a third. The club is using the 80,000 from, uh, from the election commitment plus the 20 that they are contributing, then seeking $100,000 through CSRFF. And then the city would, um, is being asked to fund the difference. Thank you, Michael. That That's a great explanation. Um, I also had quite a few questions and I'm very happy for these to be taken on notice. Um, I'll go back to the Woodville Pavilion. I note that we're moving money into reserve and if Woodville Pavilion roofing renewal was happening, should we perhaps consider doing both rather than moving funds into reserve? It'd be good to know how critical Woodville roof is rather than delay. Um, I was also interested in... Um, the removal of the Britannia Littis car park works because I was under of the understanding that we were doing realignment of the car park. In fact, we were just talking about that the other day. I just wanted to check on the removal of that $160,000. Perhaps it's not as much as needed. Um, with the arts rebound town centre art works, I was a little bit concerned to see such a substantial reduction given that the overall figure is 383000 and we're saying 147,000 is surplus. I'm wondering what that does to the scale and scope of the artworks. Um, that's, that's, you know, not quite half, but it's significant. Um, I also just really wanted to understand a bit more about the Beatty Park change room delay and whether council should actually be seeing a change request come forward. I'd like to know what the timing is now given that that was originally part of the part one of the project for last financial year. So I just really interested to see whether we can get more information about timings and whether we do need a change request. That's on the BD Park change rooms. I'm happy for these to be taken on notice. Um, the drainage increase, that was quite good to see, um, from 60 to 425,000. And I'm wondering if that will allow us to deal with the Linton Street and Lake Munger drainage issue. So just wondering where that increase in drainage funding is going, whether it's going towards that priority area. Um, 
and I just also, this is really minor, but I would really like to see some of that funding come back that was taken from the Mount Hawthorne Hawkers Market to fund, um, it was only $5,000 that went towards the football, Footyville and the, and the Waffle Ground final. Uh, could Would administration be amenable to bringing back the $5,000 so that we could do an EOI to reinstate the Hawkers Market at Mount Hawthorne? And also, could we look at, could administration consider the addition of a small amount of funding for the Young Makers Market to be considered to have round two around Easter, given that it's so highly subscribed? Um, if you are prepared to consider funding, if not, please let me know, because I would then consider um, putting forward an amendment. Any other questions, Councillor Apollo? Right, just drilling a bit more. So just a couple of clarif clarifications for the table in on page two. Um, it's And again, well, I'm happy if you do it on notice, but um, just some of the uh, anomalies between the description and the um, surplus or um, increase or decrease. So un construct mm. Norfolk Street, stage one, the second line, it's talking about reduced capex. Um, and then the comment says 25K, but the amount says 250K, um, and whether that's an increase in CapEx um, or not. Then there's um, the North Perth Bowling Club um, references to increase in capital spend, but a reduction in CapEx of 220, and uh, the references to 100, 120K versus 220K. Um, and then the one under that, the bank's reserve master plan, increase in capital spending of 150K, but it's it's showing a negative 250K. So it's probably just uh, typos, but if, if if they aren't, if they do need to be corrected, can we get that for the for next week? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. So uh, what the table is um, trying to show is the impact of surplus. So essentially, um, where they're negative, we're essentially spending more on CapEx, and where they're positive, it's a reduction in CapEx. So um, for Norfolk Street, where you're saying 250, we're saying we are spending 250 less because now the grant is capped at 25. So we're just going to match the grant of 25 versus a grant of 125 previously. Um, and then for the two down the bottom, that's where we're essentially saying we're going to be spending more uh, because uh, for the, for example, Banks, Banks Reserve Master Plan, we're receiving additional grant funding and we're also receiving additional grant funding for North Perth. So to match that grant funding, we're going to have to spend additional capex. So these mounts are literally just the impact surplus from a capital expended perspective. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to mention that the our reconciliation of the Waffle Grand final costs uh, that were attached to two weeks old, and we're just sorting out some of the final invoices around some of the larger items related to traffic. Uh, management and the turf costs. Uh, so we will be updating that attachment, Mayor Cole, uh, for Friday and for the OCM next Tuesday. Just on that, there was some discussion about trying to measure um, impact for local businesses, et cetera. I've had a chat to local traders, but I'm just wondering if we are going to get any feedback. Uh, good question, Mirko. I might just ask the manager to join. We're going to put together a project closure report for council. This was an unplanned, unexpected That's okay. Project. I mean, we don't need to talk about it now. So, uh, I mean, unless, as is yes. Unless you really want to, manager. Uh, so, um, we, we, did, we, we had the survey. <laughs> just to drag it out. We had the survey out uh, on the day where people swipe their QR code. That, and that's that fine. Stuff. As long as we're getting a closure report, yes. we've got getting that me those metrics coming back. That would be very useful. Including the spending data and also we'll share our project closure reports with the WA Football Commission. Yeah, so fantastic. We'll that. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions on the first quarter budget review? Okay. All right. Item 7.5, advertising of amended policy sponsorship to the city policy. Councillor Hallett. Um, in section 2.1, it refers to not seeking sponsorship from orgs or individuals with an identifiable political purpose. Can I just seek clarity to confirm that that would include all NGOs that engage in advocacy um, and also members of parliament sponsoring prizes at city events?
uh, through me call, we'll take that one on notice and we'll, could, could you just repeat the question? And also, do you have a particular organization in mind where it's unclear whether or not uh, p- political, I would interpret as party political, so a registered political party, there are literally thousands of organizations which work on advocacy on their particular issues, which operate in the political sphere, but are not registered political parties. They would be um, associations, organizations, interest groups. Uh, I wouldn't count those advocacy organizations unless they were a registered political party as a political organization. Um, political parties mentioned elsewhere, so this is separate to that. So it does cover organizations that might be doing some kind of advocacy. I can't really think of specific examples where the money wouldn't be going the other way, but um, just thinking things like conservation organizations or, yeah. Does that mean that John Kerry can't give out prizes at the seniors' lunch? <laughs> Too, Michael, I'm not. I'm not sure if the state member asked our permission. He just arrives and starts handing out the gifts. Well, I think uh, there's a, you know I, it's I, about I, scale and mm-hmm. what's political versus what's a sort of. I don't know. There might just be. You've raised an interesting question anyway, I think. Could we just also check about, like, the gardening awards, the garden awards? Yes, if I mean, there have been secateurs that have been and provided. And I guess I'm not seeking to get rid of that. I feel that that is something that could possibly be handled within the policy. Yeah, I think that it does raise that, um, you know, because we do, we have um, we have had local members say we'll sponsor a prize at the garden competition, that we will provide a raffle, um, a gift box at the seeing as lunch so is that intended we just need to decide is that in or out of the policy are those things considered to be political or is that part of a local member being a local member a few more call just so that's our uh, item 2 2.2 2, 2.1 sponsorship should not be sought from political parties or organizations individuals with an identifiable 2.2 i think yeah 2.2 yeah. uh the way i'd read it i think we can clarify uh Sponsorship should not be sought from political parties, uh, which is the political association, or organisations, individuals with, um, for a party political purpose, which is, so that's different. So we're not getting, the money wouldn't be received for a party political purpose, uh, i.e. electioneering, campaigning, um, but uh, that would then exclude um, organisations which may have a policy agenda. Um, which some people might, but that's separate from maybe a party political platform. So uh, we'll try to, I think we can tweak that wording to uh, be a little bit more practical. Any other questions on the policy? Councillor Warner? Um, I don't know if this is just me, but I feel like there's the elephant in the room here and I feel like this is our opportunity to gather community feedback on how we feel about fossil fuel sponsorship. I feel like this is something that's inevitably going to come to, to Vincent. It, it came to... Is this a question, Councillor Warner? Is this or a, a question? Is this, a, is this something that we have considered putting out for consultation? It is a good question. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, there's probably a connection to uh, the other items we have on the OCM agenda around our investment policy where council does have a uh, stated position that we're looking to divest uh, our investments from uh, financial institutions uh, with fossil fuel interests. Uh, I'm happy to take that one on notice. It's interesting because here it says sponsors could not be sought or obtained from organisations whose business conflicts with the city's public health objectives. It could say public health and divestment objectives, for example. That could potentially be an amendment or administration may wish to consider that given that there's the alignment with the divestment policy. Uh, Fiume Cole will uh, we'll rework uh, that paragraph based on those last two comments and uh, alignment with the city's divestment approach. Any further questions on this one? Okay, thank you. That takes us to Chief Executive Officer Items 8.1, Policy Document Register and Review Plan, Progress Update and Implementation Review 2022. Councillor Gontoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, look, I think this is a really useful document, isn't it? Um, and just wondered if some... Uh, 
I guess we're being asked to um, approve the updated policy document register and review plan at attachment one, but the document that's at attachment one is a track changes document. So it would be, um, I guess I'm, I'm always interested in seeing the track changes document, but I think we should approve a clean version. Um, wondering if we could um, see some consistency in relation to the proposed review dates. Some of them are um, subject to consultation end of 22, so they're a bit vague. Some of them it's a whole year. Um, some of it's a month, some of it's a range. They're like the four, first, I think, a couple of entries in the, the green are all different. Um, and so some consistency would be really useful. Um, I think uh, to potentially understand when, if a review has started and is ongoing um, or if a review is going to start at a particular date and I guess what, you know, review means is this the part of the process where administration is undertaking that internal review prior to um, sending out the policy paper or is this the review in terms of it has there's been some engagement with council and um, and the process is I guess part of that um, I guess has, has been on the public record somehow so I would appreciate some I guess clarity on that um, I think in terms of the um, content, the um, and it would also be good to know through this document, and I think this was potentially the intent of the track changes, um, what's changed since the last time we council reviewed this particular document. Um, and this is possibly a little bit like the audit log. Uh, so I appreciate that the intent of wanting to include that, but it would also be really good to, I uh, guess, get an understanding of what the policy review health like is it on track according to or has it been you know delayed if we given that um i think our policy document uh, policy review policy talks about every policy being reviewed every four years um as to whether they um the policy is considered to be on track to be reviewed within that time frame or um is overdue um, whether it's because the review didn't start on time or that it has somehow um, had a lag in the review process. So that would be really useful if some of those suggestions could be um, considered for inclusion in that documented attachment one. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, some very good points and questions. Uh, we will look at how we can, uh, the, the final document talks about the number of policies being reviewed. Uh, we might then be able to essentially have a balance sheet of how many, uh, what percentage of policies are uh, past their review date or, and we'll look at uh, doing that, including, we didn't get any questions on the financial reports, but I highly commend the work the finance team has done on the Capital Works uh, reporting, where we now have a traffic light system. There's a stage system one to seven to talk about where a capital work project is between not started uh, scope being prepared, um, uh, engagement, procurement, delivery. So there's a seven step uh, number and key, which I think we could potentially apply in a similar way to the policy review program. Uh, we'll speak to the policy review program manager to update that report. Uh, can I just get an indication of whether or not council wants that, uh, that new sort of traffic lighting for next Tuesday or just for the, the following uh, report after that? Yeah, this, I guess I'd just like to have a, a clean version for us Going to approve forward. as at attachment um, one, I think it, it was, um, but then for future reviews. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Wallace? Thanks, Michael. Um, it was just around some of the heritage management policies, like the 7.6 series. Um, they've been pushed back to 2023, 20, 24. Um, I get... I, familiar with some of these, the heritage management bonuses in particular, I think is quite outdated. It refers to previous planning schemes and it's basically unusable in its current format, I think. I'm just wondering if 2023, 24 is still an appropriate time frame from that, noting it's been pushed back since early this year, um, or with, whether that is a priority for the city. Through Mayor Cole, it's definitely a priority. I'll take that question on notice and speak to uh, the policy team 
uh, there is now some work we need to do around our municipal heritage uh, list and register, which needs a review and update. I'll have to check whether that's a contingency on updating that review. So we'll include that in the briefing notes. Councillor Wallace, are you saying that, that there are some potentially some immediate changes that could be made that, you know, like, is that a consideration? Like if there's immediate changes that need to be made to have alignment, did you say with the scheme? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess council needs to consider whether they still want to award bonuses for retaining heritage structure with respect to this particular one. Um, and then, you know, like the bonuses that are listed within there aren't currently able to be applied because I think they contravene our current planning scheme and the state planning framework. Okay. Yeah, don't sounds, quite be on that. Sounds that's layered a, and complicated. A hunch rather than... <laughs> well, we'll wait for some advice and back from admin on that one. Yeah. Um, and just with respect to the heritage inventory, I think we're overdue significantly for updating that. And that's being pushed to 23, 24 again as well. Is that an issue given how much we value heritage around here? Uh, through me, Cole, I'll get some advice from the team on uh, the timing around that, including the prioritization and resourcing of it. Great, thank you. Councillors, okay. Um, 8.2, Inner City Group Memorandum of Understanding Extension. Any queries on this one? It's effectively the same document for another three years. Okay. Um, and 8.3, Information Bulletin. Okay, no questions. Okay, so that does leave one confidential item that we do need to discuss this evening, which is 11.1. .1. Um, that does mean that we do need to move behind closed doors. It does concern commercial incompetence matters. So um, thank you for your attendance this evening, Don and Craig. Really nice to see you here. And um, we will just need to also cease the live stream for, a, I think, we, because it's not a council meeting, we won't, we won't come back because once we've dealt with this, any questions on this item, then we will be concluded. So for those who have joined us on the live stream,